Hello, welcome to the best of the day from the ASCO 2015 meeting. Today we are going to talk about the best of the presentations in the lung cancer track. We'll cover lung cancer and mesothelioma. I am Ramaswamy Govindan, a medical oncologist at Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. Joining me today is my dear colleague, Dr. Ann So from MD Anderson Cancer Institute. Thank you for having me. So Ann, it's always great to have you. So today we're going to talk about a number of things. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll start off with metastatic non-small cell lung cancer, and then we'll talk a little bit about locally advanced non-small mm -hmm. cell lung cancer. Then I thought we could talk about a couple of interesting presentations on small cell lung cancer, and then finally we'll end up, end up with a disease that's very dear to you, yes. uh, and that is mesothelioma. Sounds is that perfect. okay? Sounds great. Perfect. Let's get started. Mm -hmm. Now the big bus is all about immunotherapy. Yes, it's quite a lot of excitement on that today. So tell us about the interesting papers that you've seen at this meeting mm -hmm. regarding immunotherapy. So as we all know, for squamous cell carcinoma, we already have an indication for nivolumab in the second line setting. So it was very eagerly anticipated to see the Checkmate 057 trial, which is in non-squamous, non-small cell lung cancer. And the data was actually quite compelling, which is why there's this big buzz right now. Not only did the patients who were salvaged, uh, non-small cell lung cancer that were non-squamous, they had a superior overall survival benefit. The hazard ratio of 0.7, it was statistically significant. The median overall survival was 12.2 months with nivolumab versus nine months roughly with docetaxel. Mm -hmm. So that clearly was very important because the toxicity profile of nivolumab is actually less than what you would expect right. with docetaxel. These are very similar to what we have seen with squamous cell lung cancer, right? Mm -hmm. Just to recap in NEVO, if I recall uh, correctly, the one-year survival rate actually doubled with NEVO compared to docetaxel. The response rate was also twice, 9 versus 20% mm -hmm. with NEVO. Uh, these results are somewhat similar. Yes, and the only thing that is a little bit more unique um, with the non non-squamous, non-small cell lung cancer, is that the PDL1 biomarker that they mm -hmm. looked at, it did seem to correlate with response where you have more expression, you have a better response, mm -hmm. um, but the PDL1 negative patients didn't seem to benefit as much as you would hope. So that brings us uncomfortable topic yes. <laughs> that the biomarkers <laughs> with the PD1, PDL1 inhibitors. And I have seen, uh, you know, the simple expression score from, you know, various different ways. Uh, and also I've seen um, different kinds of assays where you not only look at the tumor cells, but also the mm -hmm. immune cells. Mm -hmm. Can you give us uh, your perspective on uh, yeah. what do you think about? So with all the PD-1, PD-L1 inhibitors, um, the ones that are leading the charge right now, nivolumab, we have pembrolizumab coming up, we also have atezolizumab, um, which used to be MPDL3280. All of these companies with these agents have different antibodies, different assays that they're utilizing. Mm -hmm. And so what we've learned from nivolumab and the pembrolizumab data, which uses a DACO antibody, um, they basically are looking at tumor staining. Mm -hmm. And they look at the function of the percentage staining. Um, and that's how they classify the patients. Now with the Genentech agent, uh, the atezolizumab, they are actually looking at both immune cell staining for PDL1 as well as the tumor cells. And they have a little bit more of a complicated system set up. But what we are seeing in general is that if you are high expression of the PDL1, you seem to have a better response rate to the agent. But I just want to make a quick point that we have to watch out for in the future. All of these immunotherapies appear to be prolonging overall survival in the second right. salvage setting. So that's crucial but they're not necessarily giving us such high response rates or necessarily big progression-free survival benefit. So the thought is that these agents might actually have a long-term benefit for mm -hmm. our patients that's translated into overall survival. Mm -hmm. And so maybe the PDL1 biomarker is not necessarily as critical as we think given the overall survival data. Sure. I just want to uh, just quickly recap what we've been talking about. So with the PD-1 inhibitor and PDL one inhibitors, we are now beginning to see uh, responses that are better than chemotherapy in the salvage That's setting. Mm -hmm. And also we see an increase in overall survival as well. We see both in squamous as well as in non-squamous, non-small cell lung cancer. I think it's fair to say that the biomarker development is uh, it's a work in progress. We yes. don't have the final answers yet. 
it's very hard to deny a, a group of patients a therapy that might be effective, especially when you don't have very many options. Mm -hmm. And very quickly, before we move on, uh, I understand that there are a number of studies being planned in the frontline setting mm -hmm. in combination with chemotherapy or mm -hmm. in comparison with chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. Any yes, thoughts? I think that that's going to be absolutely essential. Um, while in the salvage setting, I don't think a biomarker is necessarily as relevant given all the survival data that has been coming out, I do think that if we're going to consider using an immunotherapy in place of chemo, we should be selecting those patients by a biomarker to tell us that they will have benefit. So I think having a biomarker in the frontline setting is critical. Um, so that would be the difference between frontline versus salvage. Now, whether or not we have immunotherapy as monotherapy in frontline, or if we do the immunotherapy in combination with the platinum doublet remains to be seen. Right. So, and then certainly the immunotherapy is continued as a maintenance sure. afterwards. So it's fair to say they are here to stay, and we have to learn to manage the side effects, which seem fairly manageable. I yes, think we'll learn a lot more as we go along. Yeah, the agents all have had different toxicity profiles in terms of classes of drugs. The CTLA-4 mm -hmm. inhibitors, um, ipilimumab, tremolimumab, seem to have more colitis, um, elevation of liver function tests. Um, the PD-1, PDL ones don't seem to have that so much, but they can get mm -hmm. dyspnea um, as a common side effect and fatigue, um, and also sometimes anorexia. Mm -hmm. But I think it's fair to say that any immunotherapy can give you any type of autoimmune phenomenon. Right. Right. So. So moving on to uh, the next uh, topic in the metastatic non-small cell lung cancer, about the EGFR mutation mm -hmm. subgroup. Do mm -hmm. you want to talk about a... Well, so this is a little bit of an old hat, but it's going to be very exciting. So there's two agents that have FDA breakthrough designation, uh, rosalitinib and then also AZD9291. Mm -hmm. And so both of these agents specifically target T790 mutation, which is a resistance mutation. And as you know, most of our EGFR mutants, about 50%, will oftentimes progress on a first-generation EGFR TKI or FATNIP, whatever you use, um, and can have this acquired resistant mutation. So I think these agents are going to definitely provide new therapeutic options for our patients. We're all eagerly awaiting FDA approval so that we can actually be able to give it to right. our patients. Right. Mm -hmm. And they seem to be very well tolerated. They are mutant mm -hmm. specific. Mm -hmm. And in fact, there will be, a, uh, you know, there will be more papers, more studies coming out on the role of these agents in the frontline setting. Mm -hmm. And we saw one, you know, initial peek into that. Uh, Suresh Ramalingam presented mm -hmm. the data in the frontline setting mm -hmm. for a phase one expansion. And those results look very promising. They very good, With yes. excellent disease control in over 95% of patients with... Uh, with the AZD9291, a small study, small mm -hmm. subgroup of the mm -hmm. phase one study, about 60 patients or so, but mm -hmm. clearly they're also going to be moving into the front line, much like the immune therapy checkpoint Absolutely. Inhibitors. I mean, they have so much less rash and diarrhea. Right. Right. So just in terms of tolerability and quality of life, I think that they're essential to bring in to our therapeutic armamentarium. So the question is, as you mentioned, about half the patients who progress after First line, first generation EGFR TK inhibitors have the T790M mutation. So when you use these drugs that are active against T790M, what's going to be the resistance mechanism that we have to see how That's an that evolution would evolve. in progress. <laughs> right, and so hopefully we'll have better and better therapies. Mm -hmm. And obviously these patients, when they progress could also be candidates for immunotherapy. And Absolutely. so far, there's nothing to suggest that, that it's not appropriate mm -hmm. for them. So definitely we should consider that as well for these mm -hmm. patients. And we also have other new agents in, for instance, that can be used in salvage, um, squamous and non-squamous, which is the Ramsirumab plus right. docetaxel, which just got at FDA Absolutely. indication yeah. earlier this year. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Anything on ALK positive, non-small so cell? So what's new, I would say, because we already know about the crizotinib and seritinib, mm -hmm. uh, which both have FDA approval, is electinib. Um, so electinib is already approved in Japan, so it's mm -hmm. widely used there. Um, it is one of our second generation ALK inhibitors. Um, it appears to have an excellent toxicity profile with uh, markedly less GI side effects. Um, and it has probably a response rate for systemic disease in cruzotinib failure patients of about 50%. Mm -hmm. And then also, it classes the blood-brain barrier, um, and it actually has close to 50-60% shrinkage of CNS mets, mm -hmm. and they've actually seen some complete responses with the use of electinib. So this is definitely a great drug, I think, to add to our therapeutics mm -hmm. um, for our ALK patients.
So, and I want to talk about small cell lung cancer. So, in fact, I give the same chemotherapy for my patients, what they were giving when I was in seventh grade. <laughs> Nothing has changed. Mm -hmm. And every year at the ASCO meeting, we see a bunch of negative studies on small cell and then go home frustrated about this. Have things changed in mm -hmm. small cell? Well, I think that we are at the beginning of a very promising era for small cell. Um, there is a trial that I think is very worthy to note, although it's early, and it's a study looking at salvage uh, small cell lung cancer, and it's looking at nivolumab versus the combination of nivolumab and ipilimumab. Now, nivolumab is a PD-1 inhibitor, and you know the ipilimumab is a CTLA-4 mm -hmm. inhibitor. So combining two different checkpoint areas right. of the immune system, um, and inhibiting that might potentially increase activity for our patients right. against small cell. And indeed, what they found in this report is that there was a higher response rate with the combination of the nivolumab and ipilimumab. It was 25% versus 15% with nivolumab mm. alone. And they didn't report that there was a significant increase in toxicity. So I think that that is definitely something to watch out for in the future. You know, I don't know about you, but I think these results are fairly compelling to go forward in my view, I think they should be you know, tested further, studied, mm -hmm. and if these results hold up, I really would think that this would be practice changing. I think that's definitely possible, especially given that there's so many small cell trials right. being presented that are all negative. Right, <laughs> right, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Because the last approved drug here was what, Topotecan? Yes, right? so it's been a while line, yeah. since, uh, mm -hmm. since you know, 15, 20 years. Mm -hmm. I also, outside of this meeting, as you may know very well from your own institution, you know, Lauren Bias reported the PARP activity yes. in small cell lung cancer mm -hmm. and the PARP inhibitors, you know, seem to be active in this disease in combination with temozolomide. It's a part of a study that many of us are yes. running. We have seen activity. I just want to know whether you have any thoughts. Yes, I think the PARP inhibitors is a very promising area of research, but I also think aurora kinase inhibitors is also right. interesting. So I do believe that this is a new era, era mm -hmm. of research for small cell that hopefully will change what has been sure. a decade of having nothing work. I, I think we're going to see some changes towards. We're still mm -hmm. to, towards you know, improvement, but we still have a long way to go. But mm -hmm. I think uh, I, I'm actually quite encouraged by what we yeah, see absolutely. here. Absolutely. And moving on to mesothelioma. <laughs> yes. I know it's your passion. You work on this quite a bit. So can you tell us a little bit about yes, what's happening so here? it's actually quite uh, promising in the sense that there are two oral abstracts being presented today, uh, two phase three trials. Um, one is from the French intergroup, um, and the other is an Italian study, I believe. And so both of them are looking at anti-angiogenic agents. So in the French group, the MAPS trial, um, they're actually looking at cisplatin pemetrexide frontline with and without bevacizumab. And what they showed is with the triplet regimen, they prolonged progression-free survival and overall survival. The overall survival results were improved by close to 2.7 months. Mm. So this is the first time that we've seen a triplet regimen in a large phase three study in mesothelioma show benefit. Mm -hmm. And I want your take on this, if I recall right, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, a study was done a while ago comparing gemcitabine cisplatin with bevacizumab yes. or with or without, yes. if I recall. And that trial actually in the tent to treat population was negative. There were also t a couple of phase two trials looking at cispem with and without bevacizumab conducted here in North America that were also negative huh. for the intent to treat population. But what I would say is when you do subgroup analysis and you look at the levels of serum VEGF in the patients, because remember, bevacizumab targets the ligand VEGF and uh -huh. tries to get it out of circulation. But if you have higher than the median level of serum VEGF, you are much more resistant to bevacizumab. Mm. If you were below the median of the serum VEGF, then you actually got benefit for PFS and OS with the addition of bevacizumab. Mm. So I think that antiangiogenics are highly relevant in mesothelioma. Now, whether or not bevacizumab is the correct agent to use is hard to say. Mm -hmm. um, we have a SWOG trial, SWOG0905, that uses sidirinib with cisplatin pemetrexid, and we presented our initial data a couple of years ago from the first phase one, where we more than doubled progression-free survival and also prolonged overall survival by over six months. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's great. Mm -hmm. And what about the other one? Yes, so that is also an anti-angiogenic agent. It's mm -hmm. um, ADI-TNF, 
Mm -hmm. um, and they were basically looking in the salvage setting. And so this agent, although it didn't meet its primary endpoint in the trial, it nevertheless did show that there was prolongation of progression-free and overall survival in the patients that received it. So again, this is what I mean, I'm not sure what the correct anti-angiogenic therapy will be, mm -hmm. but it's clear that this pathway has relevance in mesothelioma. By the way, pembrolizumab has been shown to be active in mesothelioma yes. as well. Yes, right? immunotherapies. Immunotherapies, I think, have a place as well in mesothelioma. Mm -hmm. um, I think that we do need to do more studies. Um, there have been some evidence in sort of tumor tissue retrospective analyses demonstrating mm -hmm. that mesothelioma does express PDL1. Right. Um, and in fact, in the worst mesothelioma, sarcomatoid, they have the highest expression. So I think immunotherapies will be highly relevant. Um, we did see at AACR. Uh, one mm -hmm. of the other meetings um, that there was some efficacy from the pembrolizumab data right. and it correlated with pdl one expression. Mm -hmm. So and let's just wrap up this session with the trials in progress. Mm -hmm. Full disclosure, I am one of the principal investigators mm -hmm. for a couple of these trials. And the Alchemist trial is this large, you know, mm -hmm. early stage non-small cell lung cancer study where 8,000 patients or so will be screened after complete resection. The idea is to find patients who have EGFR mutation or ALK uh, translocation, and we would put them in appropriate therapeutic clinical trials with mm -hmm. EGFR inhibitor, that is erlotinib or crisotinib, mm -hmm. and uh, in a randomized setting after standard of care therapy. And we hope to do the sequencing, whole genome sequencing or exome sequencing in all those 8,000 patients to understand what's happening in this, uh, you know, in the, in the tumor landscape. And, and that's absolutely essential in the early stage lung cancer population because if we're going to truly cure these patients, we have to understand their natural biology and we also need to see if there's any alternatives to giving them more targeted agents that give you good quality of life rather than forcing everybody to get adjuvant chemotherapy right. when some we know don't off necessarily protocol, benefit. Right. Yeah. I don't think we should be giving these agents off protocol uh, even agreed. if they have EGFR mutation agreed, or positive. But, but these trials are so crucial right. to further our understanding to potentially alter or change our field for Absolutely. the future. Absolutely. And similarly, we have a study ongoing in stage 3 non small mm -hmm. cell lung cancer. Both of us are involved in this. Mm -hmm where we screen patients for EGFR mutation or ALK positive non-small cell lung cancer, treat them with the specific agents followed by different of chemo radiation or just chemo radiation in the, mm -hmm. the randomized setting. And then we have the lung map protocol, which mm -hmm. is being reworked with the approval of nivolumab. So it's really a lot of interesting things that are emerging. Plus we saw a number of uh, combination studies being presented yes. in various forums with immunotherapy checkpoint inhibitors. And I think it really, it's a, it's a very interesting you know, time. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm really hopeful that with all the studies that we are doing and, um, and the scientific progress we are making, we can actually improve the outcomes of patients with lung cancer. Well, it's really remarkable because what we're doing now in lung cancer, we're achieving more in one year with FDA approval indications for drugs compared to some decades in the past. Right. So it's a very exciting time right now for lung Absolutely. cancer. Absolutely. We would strongly encourage our audience and community oncologists to enroll patients in clinical trials. And I want to thank you for, for this wonderful summary of what happened at ASCO meeting in 2015 with regard to lung presentations. As always, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much. And thank you to you for listening to this presentation.